<clears throat> Continuation of part one. The vampires had dragged me several blind steps while this was going on. The numbness now noted dispassionately that they were wearing gloves, as if this suddenly made it all right, the panic subsided. One of my feet hurt. I'd already managed to stub it on something, invisible in the dark. The material of the gloves felt rather like leather, the skin of what animal, I thought. You sure are a quiet one, the second vampire said to me. Aren't you going to beg for your life or anything? It laughed. He laughed. Shut up, said the first vampire. I didn't know why I knew this, since I couldn't see or hear them, but I knew the other vampires were following, except for one or two who were flitting through the trees ahead of us. Maybe I didn't know it. Maybe I was imagining things. We didn't go far, and we went slowly. For whatever reason, the two vampires holding me let me pick my shaky, barefoot, human way across bad ground in the dark. It must have seemed slower than a crawl to them. There was still a moon, but that light through the leaves only confused matters further for me. I didn't think this was an area I was familiar with, even if I could see it. I thought I could feel a bad spot not too far away, further into the trees. I wondered if vampires felt bad spots the way humans did. Everyone wondered if vampires had anything to do with the presence of bad spots, but bad spots were mysterious. The voodoo wars had produced bad spots, and, the, and vampires had been the chief enemy in the wars, but even the globe net didn't seem to know anymore. Everyone in the area knew about the presence of bad spots around the lake, whether they went hiking out there or not, but there's never been, but there's never any gossip about sucker activity. Vampires tend to prefer cities, the higher density of human population, presumably. The only noises were the ones I made, and a little hush of water, and the stirring of the leaves in the air off the lake. The shoreline was more rock than marsh, and when we crossed a ragged little stream, the cold water against my feet was a shock. I'm alive, it said. The rational numbness now pointed out that vampires could, apparently, cross running water under at least some circumstances. Perhaps the size of the stream was important. I observed that my two guards had stepped across it bank to bank. Perhaps they didn't want to get their shoes wet, as they had the luxury of shoes. It would be bad business for the electric moat companies if it became known that running water didn't stop suckers. I could feel the what increasing. Oppression, tension, suspense, foreboding. I, of course, was feeling all these things. But we were coming closer to wherever we were going, and my escorts didn't like the situation either. I told myself I was imagining this, but the impression remained. We came out of the trees and paused. There was enough moonlight to make me blink, or perhaps it was the surprise of coming to a clear area. Somehow you don't think of suckers coming out under the sky in a big open space, even at night. There had been a few really grand houses on the lake. I'd seen pictures of them in magazines, but I'd never visited one. They had been abandoned with the rest during the wars and were presumably either burned or blasted or derelict now. But I was looking up a long, once landscaped slope to an enormous mansion at the head of it. Even in the moonlight, I could see how shabby it was. It was missing some of its shingles and shutters, and I could see at least one broken window, but it was still standing. Where we were would once have been a lawn of smooth, perfect green, and I could see scars in the earth near the house that must have been garden paths and flower beds. There was a boathouse whose roof had fallen in, near us where we stood at the shore. The bad spot was near here, behind the house, not far. I was surprised there was a building still relatively in one piece this close to a bad spot. There was a lot I didn't know about the wars. I felt I would have been content to go on not knowing. Time to get it over with, said Bo's lieutenant. <clears throat> they started walking up the slope toward the house. The others had melted out of the trees, wherever they'd been meanwhile, and were straggling behind the three of us, my two jailers and me. My sense that none of them was happy became stronger. I wondered if their willingness to walk through the woods at fumbling human speed had anything to do with this. 
I looked up at the sky, wondering almost calmly if this was the last time I would see it. I glanced down into either side. The footing was nearly as bad here as it had been among the trees. There was something odd. I thought about my parents' old cabin and the cabins and cottages, or rather the remains of them around it. In the ten years since the wars had been officially ended, saplings and scrub had grown up pretty thoroughly around all of them. They should have done the same around this house, I thought. It's been cleared. Recently. That's why the ground is so uneven. I looked, around, I looked again to either side. Now that I was looking, it was obvious that the forest had been hacked back too. The big house was sitting all by itself in the middle of a wide expanse of land that had been roughly but thoroughly stripped of anything that might cause a shadow. This shouldn't have made my situation any worse, but I was suddenly shuddering and I hadn't been before. The house was plainly our destination. I stumbled and stumbled again. I was not doing it deliberately as some kind of hopeless delaying tactic. I was merely losing my ability to hold myself together. Something about that cleared space, about what this meant about whatever was waiting for me. Something about the reluctance of my escort, about the fact that therefore whatever it was that waited was more terrible than they were. My jailers merely tightened their hold and frog-marched me when I wobbled. Suckers are very strong. They may not have noticed that they were now bearing nearly all my weight, as my knees gave and my feet lost their purchase on the ragged ground. They dragged me up the last few stairs to the wide, once-elegant porch. The treads creaked under my weight as I missed my footing, while the vampires flowed up on either side of us with no more sound than they had made ranging through the woods. One of them opened the front door and stood aside for the prisoner and her guards to go in first. We entered a big, dark, empty hall. Some moonlight spilled in through open doors on either side of us, enough that my eyes could vaguely make out the extent of it. It was probably bigger than the whole ground floor of Mom and Charlie's house. At the far end, a staircase swirled up in a semicircle, disappearing into the murk overhead. We turned left and went through a half-open door. This had to be a ballroom. It was even bigger than the front hall had been. There was no furniture that I could see, but there was a muddle overhead. Its shadow had wrenched my panicky attention toward it. It looked rather like a vast chandelier, although I would have expected anything like that to have been looted years ago. It seemed like acres of floor as we crossed it. There was another muddle leaning up against the wall in front of us. A possibly human body-shaped muddle, I thought confused. Another prisoner? Another live dinner? Was waiting to be eaten in company going to be any less horrible than... Waiting alone? Where was the old-fashioned guest who liked dresses rather than jeans and sneakers? Oh, dear gods and angels, let this be over quickly. I cannot bear much more. The mother was someone sitting cross-legged, head bowed, forearm, head bowed, forearms on knees. I didn't realize till it raised its head with a liquid and human motion that it was another vampire. I jerked backward. I didn't mean to. I knew I wasn't going to get away. I couldn't help it. The vampire on my left, the one who had asked me why I didn't beg for my life, laughed again. There's some life in you after all, girly. I was wondering. Bo wouldn't like it if, we, if it turned out we caught a blanker. He wants his guest in a good mood. Bo's lieutenant said again, shut up. One of the other vampires drifted up to us and handed its lieutenant something. They passed it between them as if it had been no more than a handkerchief, but it clanked. Bo's lieutenant said, hold her. He dropped my arm and picked up my foot as casually as a carpenter picking up a hammer. I would have fallen, but the other vampire helped me fast. Something cold closed around my ankle, and when he dropped my foot again, it fell to the floor hard enough to bruise the sole because of the new weight. I was wearing a metal shackle and trailing a chain. The vampire who had brought the thing to Bo's lieutenant stretched out the end of the chain and clipped it into a ring in the wall. How many days has it been, Connie? said Bo's lieutenant softly. Ten, twelve, twenty. She's young and smooth and warm, totally flash. Bo told us to bring you a nice one. She's all for you. We haven't touched her. I thought of the gloves. He was backing away slowly as he spoke, as if the cross-legged vampire might jump at him. The vampire holding me seemed to be idly watching Bo's lieutenant, and then with a sudden spine unhinging his 
let go of me and sprang after him and the others who were dissolving back into the shadows as if afraid to be left behind. I fell down and for a moment, half stunned, couldn't move. The vampire gang was, in the sudden way of vampires, now on the other side of the big room by the door. I thought it was Bo's lieutenant who, I didn't see how, made some sort of gesture and the chandelier burst to light. You want to check out what you're getting, he said, and now that he was leaving, his voice sounded strong and scornful. Bo didn't want you to think we'd try anything nomad. And so, okay, so you don't need the light, but it's more fun if she can see you too, isn't it? The vampire who dropped me said, hey, her feet are already bleeding, if you like feet. He giggled, a high-pitched goblin screech. Then they were gone. I think I must have fainted again. When I came to myself, I was stiff all over, as if I had been lying on the floor for a long time. I both remembered and tried not to let myself quite remember what had happened. This lasted for maybe 10 seconds. I was still alive, so I wasn't dead yet. If it wanted me awake and struggling, to continue to appear to be unconscious was a good idea. I lay facing the door the gang had left by, which meant that the cross-legged vampire was behind me. Don't think about it. I was up on my knees, halfway to my feet, and scrambling for the door before I finished thinking this, even though I knew you couldn't run away from a vampire. I had forgotten that I was chained to the wall. I hit the end of my chain and fell over. I cried out, as much from fear as pain. I lay sprawled where I struck, waiting for it to be over. Nothing happened. Again, I thought, please, gods and angels, let it be over. Nothing happened. Despairingly, I sat up, hitched myself around to face what was behind me. It was looking at me. He was looking at me. The chandelier was set with candles, not electric bulbs, so the light it shed was softer and less definite. Even so, he looked bad. His eyes, no, don't look in their eyes, were a kind of gray-green, like stagnant bog water, and his skin was the color of old mushrooms, the sort of mushrooms you find screwed up in a paper bag in the back of the fridge, and try to decide if they're worth saving or if you should throw them out now and get it over with. His hair was black, but lank and dull. He would have been tall if he stood up. His shoulders were broad, and his hands and wrists, drooping over his knees, looked huge. He wore no shirt, and his feet, like mine, were bare. This seemed curiously indecent, that he should be half-naked. I didn't like it. All oh, right, I thought, good one. The train is roaring toward you, and the villain is twirling his mustache, and you're fussing that he's tied you to the track with the wrong kind of rope. There was a long, angry wheel across one of the vampire's forearms. Overall, he looked spidery, predatory, alien. Nothing human except that he was more or less the right shape. He was thin, thin to emaciated, the cheekbones and ribs looking like they were about to split the old mushroom skin. It didn't matter, the still burning vitality in that body was visible even to my eyes. He would be fine again once he'd had dinner. My teeth chattered. I pulled my knees up under my chin and wrapped my arms around them. We sat like this for several minutes, the vampire motionless, while I chattered and trembled and tried not to moan. Tried not to beg uselessly for my wife, watched him watching me. I didn't look into his eyes again. At first I looked at his left ear, but that was too close to those eyes. How could something the color of swamp water be that compelling? So I looked at his bony left shoulder instead. I could still see him staring at me, or feel him staring. Speak, he said at last. Remind me that you are a rational creature. The words had long pauses between them, as if he found it difficult to speak, or as if he had to recall the words one at a time, and his voice was rough, as if some time recently he had damaged it by prolonged shouting. Perhaps he found it awkward to speak to his dinner. If he wasn't careful, he'd go off me, like Alice after she'd been introduced to the pudding. I should be so lucky. I flinched at the first sound of his voice, both because he had spoken at all, and also because his voice sounded as alien as the rest of him looked, as if the chest that produced it was made out of some strange material that did not reflect sound, the same way that ordinary, that is to say live, flesh did. His voice sounded much odder, eerie, dire, than the voices of the vampires who had brought me here. 
You could half imagine that Bo's gang had once been human. You couldn't imagine that this one ever had. As I flinched, I squeaked, a kind of ah. Uh. First I thought rather deliriously about Alice and her pudding, and then the meaning of his words began to penetrate. Remind him I was a rational creature. I wasn't at all sure I still was one. I tried to pull my scattered wits together, come up with a topic other than Lewis Carroll. I, oh, they called you Connie, I said at random, after I had been silent too long. Is that your name? He made a noise like a cough or a growl or something else I didn't have a name for, some vampire thing. You know enough not to look in my eyes, he said, but you do not know not to ask me my name. The words came closer together this time, and there was definitely a question mark at the end. He was asking me. Oh, no, oh, I don't know. I don't know that much about them, or I gabbled, remembering halfway through the word he had not himself used the word vampire. He'd said me and my. Perhaps you didn't say vampire like you didn't ask one's name. I tried to think of everything Pat and Jesse and the others had told me over the years and considered the likelihood that the SOF view of vampires was probably rather different from the vampire's own view and of limited use to me now, and that having a mortal death very nearly memorized was no use at all. Pardon me, I said, with as much dignity as I could pretend to, which wasn't much. I, er, what would you like me to talk about? There was another of his pauses, and then he said, Tell me who you are. You need not tell me your name. Names have power, even human names. Tell me where you live and what you do if you're living. My mouth dropped open. Tell you, who am I? Sherazad? Sherazad? How do you pronounce it? Shahrazad. Shahrazad. Uh, the m main storyteller in the collection of tales known as the One Thousand and One Nights which I believe is where the story of Aladdin comes from. Okay. Who am I? Scheherazade? I felt a sudden hysterical rush of outrage. It was bad enough that I was going to be eaten, or rather drunk. My mind would revert to Alice, but I had the talk first. I am the baker at Charlie's Coffee House in town. Charlie married my mom when I was 10, just before the earth. I managed not to say before the voodoo wars, which I thought might be a sensitive subject. They have two sons, Kenny and Billy. They're nice kids. Well, Billy was still a nice kid. Kenny was a teenager. Oh, hell, I wasn't supposed to be using names. Oh, too bad. There are more than one Charlie and Kenny and Billy in the world. We all work at the coffee house, although my brothers are still in school. My boyfriend works there, too. He rules the kitchen now that Charlie has kind of become the maitre d' and the wine steward. If you want to talk about a coffee house having a maitre d' and a wine steward, Okay, I thought. I remembered not to say Mel's name. But it was hard to remember what my life was. It seemed a very long time ago, all of it. Now, tonight, chained to a wall in a deserted ballroom on the far side of the lake, talking to a vampire. I live in an apartment across town from the coffee house, upstairs from, from the old lady who owns the house. I love it there. There are all these trees, but my windows get a lot of, er, this time what I wasn't saying was sunlight which I thought might also be a touchy topic. I've always liked fooling around in the kitchen. One of my first memories is holding a wooden spoon and crying till my mom let me stir something. Before she married Charlie, my mom used to tease me, saying I was going to grow up to be a cook. Other kids played softball and joined the drama club. All I ever did was hang around the coffee house kitchen. So she said she might as well marry one, a cook, since he kept asking. Charlie kept asking. She said she was finally saying yes because she wanted to make it easy for me. That was our joke. She met him by working for him. She was a waitress. She likes feeding people, like Charlie and me and 
like Charlie and me and the cook. She thinks the answer to just about everything is a good nourishing meal, but she doesn't much like cooking, and now she mostly manages the rest of us. Works out the schedule so everyone gets enough hours and nobody gets too many very often, which is sort of the Olympic triathlon version of rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the same time. Only she has to do it every week, and she also does the books and the ordering. Um, it's just as well she's back there because a lot of people don't come to us for nourishing meals. They come for a slab of something chocolate and a glass of champagne or, or our all-day breakfast, which is eggs and bacon and sausages and baked beans and pancakes and hash browns and toast and a cinnamon roll till they run out, which they usually do by about nine. But there are muffins all day and then a free wheelbarrow ride to the bus stop after, or that's a joke. A wheelbarrow ride over our cobblestones would be no favor anyway. I have to get up at 4 a.m. to start the cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon rolls as big as your head. It's a Charlie's speciality. But I don't mind. I love working with yeast and flour and sugar, and I love the smell of bread baking. And, I mean, my boyfriend says he wanted to ask me out because he saw me the first time when I was up to my elbows in bread dough and covered with flour. He says that for most guys, it's supposed to be great legs or a girl being a great dancer. <clears throat> I can't dance at all, or at least a good personality or something high-minded like that. But for him, it was definitely watching me thump into that bread dough. I hadn't realized I'd started crying. My long-ago lost life, the tears were running, pouring down my cheeks. And suddenly the vampire moved toward me. I froze thinking, oh no, and at last, and okay, at least my last thoughts are about everybody at the coffee house. But all he did was hold one of his big hands under my chin so the tears would fall into his palm. I cried now from fear and anticipation as well as loss and sorrow, and my tears had made quite a little pool before I stopped. I stopped because I was too tired to go on, and my whole head felt squashy. I suppose I should have been flipping out. He was right next to me. He hadn't moved again. When I stopped crying, he lowered his hand and said calmly, May I have your tears? I nodded, bemused. And very precisely and carefully, he touched my face with the forefinger of his other hand, wiping up the last drops, the last drips. I was so braced for worse, I barely noticed that this time a vampire really had touched me. He moved back against the wall before he licked the wet finger and then drank the little palmful of salt water. I didn't mean to stare, but I couldn't help it. He wouldn't have had to say anything. Maybe he'd like the story of my life. Tears, he said. Not as good as a really ugly, ominous pause here, but better than nothing. Oh, gods, I said, and buried my face in my knees once more. I had begun to shiver again, too. I was exhausted past exhaustion, and I was also, it occurred to me, hungry and thirsty, and of course still waiting to die, gruesomely. I couldn't bear not to keep an eye on him for long, however, and I raised my now sticky face from my knees soon enough. I wiped my face on a corner of my ridiculous dress. I hadn't really noticed what I was wearing. There had been other things on my mind since I had been obliged to put it on. In other circumstances, I would have found it very beautiful. But an absurd thing for a coffee house baker to be wearing. Even a coffee house baker in a ballroom with a ball going on in it. If I were attending a ball, I would be there as one of the caterers. I certainly wouldn't be there for the dancing. I'm raving, I thought. The dress was a dark cranberry red, heart's blood red, I thought. It was put together slyly and panels cut on the bias, so it clung to me round the top and swung out into what felt like yards of skirt at the hem. It draped over my awkward knees and drifts like something out of a Renaissance painting. I suppose it was silk. I hadn't had a lot of close-up experience with silk. It was soft like a clean baby's skin. I knew quite a lot about babies, clean and otherwise. I glanced at him, at his left shoulder. He was still watching me. I let my gaze drift down over his ragged black trousers to his bare feet. He, too, had a shackle around one ankle. What? He was shackled and pinned to the wall just as I was. He must have seen me working it out. Yes, he said. Well, why? <clears throat> no honor among thieves, you are thinking. Indeed, Bo and I are old enemies. But 
The reason for the wasteland around the house was suddenly apparent. No shelter from daylight except inside the house. Whoever it was, Bo, thought the shackle itself might not be enough. The chain that held him was many times heavier than mine. And both the shackle and, I could see it, now that I was looking, the plates in the wall that held the ring was, were stamped with, well, to start with, with the old, most basic ward symbol, a cross and a six-pointed star inside a circle. The standard warding against inhuman harm that 10% of parents still have tattooed over their babies' hearts at birth, or so the current statistics said, it was illegal to tattoo a minor because of the possible side effects, and you nearly had to have a dispensation from a god to be granted a license for a home birth since the wars, because the government assumed that the opportunity for an illegal tattoo was the only reason anyone would want a home birth. Warding tattoos didn't happen in hospitals. Theoretically, Jesse and Pat said that no fiddling tattoo would stop a vampire, but the real reason for its being illegal is that the stiff fines levied against parents who had it done anyway was a nice little annual nest egg for the government. There was some evidence that a tempered metal ward spelled by an accredited wardsmith and worn next to the skin would discourage a vampire that unexpectedly came in contact with it long enough for you to make a run for it, maybe. The problem with that scenario is, as I said, most suckers run in packs. One of the friends of the one that let go of you would grab you and the second one would know where not to grab. I didn't want to peer too closely, but there were rather a lot of other symbols keeping the standard one company. The steak tart, I hated this one, however simple and coolly nonspecific the design. The perfect triangle, the oak tree, the unfallen angel, true grief, the singing lizard, the sun and moon. There were more too. Under other circumstances, I might have thought the effect was a little frantic, as if whoever had planned it was throwing the book at a problem they didn't know how to solve. The wordings did seem to be having some effect. The ankle the shackle encircled was swollen and a funny color, although what counted as a funny color for a vampire I wasn't sure, and looked pretty sore. The skin looked almost grated. Ugh. But if the metal ward did protect, or in this case debilitate, who had built the cat fixed, fixed the shackle? Leaving aside for the moment who had done the smith work, I dare say a wardsmith wouldn't argue if a gang of vampires showed up, and put their case persuasively enough, which is to say good wardsmiths can't provide perfect protection, even for themselves. But did Bo have non-vampires available too? The standard ward was supposed to prevent harm from the rest of the others too, which would mean that this Bo creature had human servants. Not a nice thought. Again, he seemed to read my mind. They wore gloves. <clears throat> That had been another of those really nasty pauses. I stared at him, so I thought the words do work, but a vampire can handle them so long as the vampire and, or possibly or, the words are properly insulated. I wonder what the insulation is. No, I'm sure I don't want to know. There's a blow for all the ward crafters if word gets out, though. But then again, maybe it would improve their business if it was known for certain that the words worked at all. What a lot I am, I am learning. Perhaps that was why Bo's gang had used gloves to touch me, in case of hidden ward signs. Now that I knew their attitude toward their guest a little better, I thought perhaps they were hoping I was wearing a good one, and since I was chained up making a run for it while he blew on his burned fingers or whatever wasn't an option for me. Or maybe they just haven't wanted to leave fingerprints on me. Perhaps it's not polite to handle another person's food even when you're a vampire. There was a sputter and crackle behind me. I turned sharp, sharply around. One of the candles in the chandelier was guttering. They were all burning low, casting less light than they had, but the room seemed no darker, if anything the contrary. I looked out the nearest window. Grayness. Dawn, I said. I looked back at him. He was sitting as he had been sitting since I had come into that room. Cross-legged, leaning, no, not quite leaning, straight-backed, only his head a little bowed, against the wall, arms on knees. The one time he had moved was when I'd wept. I looked at the windows in the big room.
They were big too and curtainless and on three sides. I wondered about the wheel on his arm. Daylight increased. The sun was coming up over the lake on my left. So we were on the north side of the lake. My family's old cabin was on the southeast and the city on the south. Even in the desolation where I sat, it was impossible for my heart not to lift at the coming of daylight. Dawn was usually my favorite time of day, end of darkness, beginning of light. I was kind of a light freak, I sighed. It occurred to me again that I was very hungry and even thirstier than that, and so tired that if he didn't eat me soon, I might die anyway. Joke. I didn't feel like laughing. I glanced at him. He looked even worse than he had by candlelight. How long has it been, Bo's lieutenant had said, so presumably he'd lived, if lived was the word, for some days here already. Ugh. As the light grew stronger, I could see the room more clearly. Near the corner to my left, there was a heap of something I hadn't seen before. Too small to be another vampire. No comfort. It was something lumpy in a cloth sack. For something to do, I stood shakily up watching him over my shoulder the whole time and edged over toward it. I could just reach it at the fullest extent of my chain, almost lying along the floor to do it. The vampire was tethered in the center of the wall of the room, while my staple was a little more toward this end. If our chains were the same length, then I could reach this corner, and he could not. More vampire humor? If it was me he wanted, of course, he could just pull on the chain. I stood up again. I opened the sack, a loaf of bread, two loaves of bread, a bottle of water, and a blanket. Without thinking, I broke off an end of one of the loaves, standard store bread, fluffy, without real substance, spongy texture, dry crumb, almost no aroma. Not as good as what I made. It was Carthaginian pig swill compared to what I made, but it was bread, food. I raised the end I had broken off and sniffed it more carefully. Why would they leave me food? Was it poison? Was it drugged? Would it sedate me so I wouldn't see him coming? Maybe I should want to be sedated. I was so hungry that standing there with bread in my hands made my legs tremble and I had to keep swallowing. It is food for you, he said. There is nothing wrong with it. It is just food. Why, I said again, my continuing total immersion course in vampire mores. Something like a grimace moved momentarily across his too still face. Bo knows me well. Knows, I said thoughtfully. Knows that you wouldn't right away the bale of hay to keep the goat happy while the hunters in the trees wait for the tiger. Not quite, he said. Humans can survive several days, perhaps a week without food, I believe. But you won't remain attractive for that long. Attractive. I looked down at the cranberry red dress. It had had a hard night. It was creased, and there was more than one smudge of dirt at the hem, as well as the spots that wiping a teary face make, and my feet sticking out from underneath were scratched and filthy. I would have looked no less a lady in my t-shirt and jeans. I ate the bread in my hand, and then I broke off more and ate that. It tasted no better than it looked, and while it had a funny aftertaste, I assumed that that was just flour improvers and phony flavoring garbage and nothing worse. It also might be my mouth, which tasted pretty funny anyway after the night I'd just had. I ate most of the first loaf. How long were these supplies supposed to last? I opened the bottle of water and drank a third of it. It was a standard two-quart plastic bottle of brand name spring water, and the ring seal on the lid had been intact when I twisted it loose. I looked at him again. His eyes were only half open but still watching me. He was well in shadow, but while he said his unmoving as ever, he looked smaller now, under siege. I moved into the sunlight streaming through the window. Food and water had helped, and the touch of the sun on my skin helped even more. I set the sack down again with the rest of the bread in it, and sighed and stretched, as if I were getting out of bed on a Monday morning. The one morning a week I got up after the sun did. I felt tired but alive. I clung to this tiny moment of comparative peace because most of me knew it was false. I wondered how much worse the crash would be when the rest of me remembered. Then if I hadn't had it at all. As I say, I am a light freak. My mom found this out the first year after we left my dad. She'd got this ugly, cheap, dark little apartment in the basement of an old townhouse. 
She wouldn't take any of my dad's money, so we were really poor at first, and I spent eight months crying and being sick all the time. She thought this was about losing my dad, and the doctors she took me to agreed with her because they couldn't find anything wrong with me, except listlessness and misery. But the minute she could afford it, she got us into a better apartment on the top floor of the house next door with real windows. This was when she started working for Charlie, and the minute he heard she had a sick kid, he gave her a raise. He didn't find out till later how young I was, and that she was leaving me home alone while she worked, and that the reason she tried for a job at the coffee house in the first place was because it was so close she could run home and check on me during her breaks. It was winter, and she said I spent three weeks moving around the new place, lying in every scrap of sunlight that came indoors including moving a table and a heavy chest of drawers that were in my way, and by the end of that time I was well again. I don't remember this, but I do remember that that eight months is the only time in my life I've ever been sick. I stood there in the sunlight, feeling the light and warmth of it and holding off the crash. I was still clutching the bottle of water. I looked at the vampire again. His eyes were shut, perhaps because I was standing in the light. There seemed to be a thin sheet of sweat on his skin. The vampire sweat, it didn't seem a very vampiry, vampire thing to do. I stepped out of the sunlight and his eyes half opened again. He didn't look around for me. His eyes opened on where I was. I almost stepped back into the sunlight again, but I didn't quite. I walked over to him to within easy arm's reach. You haven't killed me yet because if you did, that would mean Bo had won. Yes, he said. His voice, inflectionless as it was, sounded exhausted. Pretending to myself I didn't know what I was about to do, I held up the bottle of water. If vampires sweated, maybe they drank water too. Would you like some water? He opened his eyes the rest of the way. Why? Involuntarily, I smiled, his turn for the intensive course in human mores. I don't like bullies. This wasn't quite the whole truth, but it was as much of the truth as I knew myself. He made the cough growl noise again. Yes, he said. I held out the bottle and he took it. He sat looking at it for a moment, looked at me again, then at the bottle. He unscrewed the plastic cap. All of this was happening at ordinary human speed although all his movements had that creepy vampire fluency. But then another third of the water disappeared. I didn't see him drink. I didn't see his throat move with swallowing, but there was only one third of the water left in the bottle, and he was screwing the cap back on, and he looked a little better. The mushrooms he was the color of hadn't been in the back of the fridge quite so long, and they weren't quite so wizened. Thank you, he said. I couldn't quite bring myself to say, you're welcome. I moved far enough away again that while I was still mostly in the shade, the sun was touching my back and sat down. The band of sun warmth was a little like having a friend's arm around me. You could have just taken it. No, he said. Well, ordered me to give you some. No, he said. I sighed. I felt irritated with this treacherous, villainous, mortally dangerous creature. The weight of irony might smash what remained of my mind into pieces before he did, in fact, kill me. <clears throat> he said slowly, I can take nothing from you. I can only accept what you offer. I can at most ask. Oh, please, I said. I can refuse to let you kill me. Vampires have never killed anyone who hasn't said, oh, yes, please, I want to die. I want to die now. I want you to drink all my blood and whatever else it is that vampires do so that even my corpse is so horrible that after the police are done with it, I will be burned instantly and the ashes sterilized before they're turned over to the next of kin. I would never have said such a thing while it was dark. Daylight was my time. For a few more hours, I could forget that the nightmare would come again too soon. I was tired and half crazy with what I had already been through, and at some level I didn't care anymore. I had seen the sun once more. It was a beautiful day, and if I was going to go out now, I was going to go out still me. If you have the strength of will, you can stop me or any vampire, he said. Again the words came slowly, as they had when he had first spoken to me in the night. 
The curious thing was that he seemed to want to speak. He'd also used the word vampire. Well, so had I. These signs, and he gestured briefly at his ankle, they are effective signs. They will do what they are made for. They will contain. As Bell arranged for them to do here, they will also prevent inhuman harm to a human. But they can only do that if the human who bears the warding holds against the will of the one who stands against. Vampires are stronger than humans. Rarely can any hold out against our will. Why do you think you should not look in our eyes? We can persuade you anyway. But looking into a vampire's eyes is any human's doom. In horror, I said, then they do ask you to kill them. They do beg you to. Yes, he said. I whispered, then is it okay at the very end? Do they like it at the end? There was a long pause. No, he said. There was a longer pause. I jerked away from him, stood up, stood in the sunlight again. I pulled the bodice of the dress away from my body so the sun could pour down inside. I pushed my hair back so the light could touch all, all of my face, and then I turned around and pulled my hair up on the top of my head so that it could warm the back of my neck and shoulders. I was not going to cry again. I was not going to cry again. I could look at it as practical water conservation. I looked at him as I stood in the sunlight. His eyes were closed. I stepped out of the sunlight, still watching him. His eyes half opened as soon as I was in shadow. How long can you hold out, I said sharply, my voice too loud. How long? Again, his words were slow. It is not hunger that will break me, he said. It is the daylight. The daylight is driving me mad. Some sunset, some sunset soon, I will no longer be myself. His eyes flicked fully open. His face tipped back to stare at me. I averted my eyes, looked at the wheel on, my, on his forearm. I may kill you then. I may kill myself. I don't know. The history of vampires is a long one, but I do not know of anyone who has had quite this experience. I sat down. I heard myself saying, can I do anything? You are doing it. You are talking to me. I, I said, I'm not much of a talker. Our wait staff are the ones who know how to talk and listen. I'm out back most of the time, getting on with the baking. Although several of our regulars hung around out back if they felt like it. There was also a tiny patio area behind the coffee house that Charlie always meant to get done up so we could use it for more seating. But he never did, maybe partly because it had become a kind of private clubhouse for some of the regulars. When the fan wasn't going but the bakery doors were open, I listened to the conversations and people came and leaned on the threshold so I could listen more easily. Pat and Jesse's more interesting stories got told out back. The worst time is the hours around noon, he said. My mind is full of, he paused. My mind feels as if it is disintegrating, as if the rays of your sun are prizing me apart. Silence fell again, and the sun rose higher. I don't suppose you'd be interested in recipes, I said a little wildly. My bran and corn and oatmeal muffins are second only to cinnamon rolls and the numbers we sell. And then there's all the other stuff, lots more muffins, I can make Spartan muffins out of anything, and tea bread and yeast bread and cookies and brownies and cakes and stuff. On Friday and Saturday I make pies, even Charlie doesn't know the secrets of my apple pie. I suppose the secret would be safe with you. Charlie didn't know the secret of my bitter chocolate death either, but I didn't feel like mentioning death in the present circumstances, even chocolate ones. The vampire's eyes were half open, watching me. I haven't got much more life to tell you about. I'm not a deep thinker. I only just made it through high school. I was a rotten student. I hated learning stuff for tests only because someone told me I had to. The only thing I was ever any good at was literature and writing with Miss Yanovsky. June Yanovsky had tangled with the school board because she chose to teach a, se a section of classic vampire literature to her junior elective. She said that denying kids the opportunity to discuss Dracula and Carmilla and immortal death was in the same category of muddle-headed, misguided protectiveness that left them to believe that they couldn't get pregnant if they did it standing up with their shoes on. She won her case. 
I would have dropped out if it wasn't for her, and also Charlie really laid into me about how much my mom would hate it if I did. He was right. He usually is, especially about my mom. I'd been working at the coffee house since I was 12, and I went straight from part-time to full-time after I graduated. I'd never done anything. The furthest I'd been from New Arcadia is the ocean a few times on vacation, when the boys were little and the coffee house smaller and Charlie could still be dragged away occasionally. I like to read. My best girlfriend is a librarian, but I don't have time to do much except work and sleep. Sometimes I feel like there ought to be something. An image of my grand formed in my memory, an image from the last time I had seen her. I had never decided whether or not it was only hindsight that made me feel she had known I would not see her again, that she was going away. Superficially, she had seemed as she always had. She had said goodbye as she always had. There was nothing different about that meeting except that it had been the last. Sometimes I feel like there should be something else, but I don't know what it is. Slowly, I added, that's why I drove out to the lake last night. I couldn't let the silence after that linger. You could tell me about your life, I said, or life, what did you call it, your whatever. You must have done lots of stuff besides, or no, he said. That was clear enough. I looked over my shoulder. The sun was getting up there. I looked at him again. The old mushroom color was very bad again, and there was definitely sweat on his skin. He looked like he was dying, or he would have if he was human. He only didn't look like he was dying because he didn't look human. You could tell me a story, he said. The words were almost gasped. Did vampires breathe? A what? I said stupidly. A story, he said. Pause. You have little brothers. You told them stories? Scheherazade had it easy, I thought. All she was risking was a nice, clean beheading from some human with a cleaver. And while her husband was off his rocker, at least he was human. Oh, um, yes, I guess. But, you know, Puss in Boots, Paul Bunyan, Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel, the night in the oak tree. And they were always wanting stories about spacemen and laser guns. I read all of Burroughs' Mars books and all of Quartermain's Alpha Centauri books to give me ideas. Except the women in my stories weren't so hopeless. Nothing very, er, riveting. Puss in Boots, he said. Yeah, you know, fairy tales. That's the one when the cat does all this clever stuff to help his master out, so his master winds up really important and wealthy, and marries the princess, even though he was only the miller's son. Fairy tales, he said. Yes, I wanted to ask him if he hadn't been a child once, that surely he remembered fairy tales. Surely every child got told fairy tales. Or if it had been that long ago that he couldn't remember. Or maybe you forgot everything about being human once you were a vampire. Maybe you had to. In that case, how did he know I would have told my brother's stories? There are lots of them. Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, The Twelve Dancing Princesses, the Fog Prince, the Brave Little Tailor, Jack the Giant Killer, Tom Thumb. My brothers liked the ones best that had the least kissing in them, so they liked Puss in Boots and Jack the Giant Killer rather than Cinderella and Snow White, who they thought were all playing. I agreed with them, actually. What is your favorite fairy tale? I made a noise that under other circumstances might have been a laugh. Beauty and the Beast, I said. Tell me that one, he said. What? Tell me the fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast, he said. Oh, yes. Um, I'd learned to tell this one myself uh, almost first of all, because the pictures of the beast in the storybooks always annoyed me, and I didn't want any kids under my influence to get the wrong idea about him. I wondered if any even more than you... I wondered if any even more than usually misguided illustrator had ever tried to make him look like a vampire. Well, there was this merchant, I began obediently. He was very wealthy, and he had three daughters. How to tell a story. How to make it go on and on to fill the time. How to get interested in it yourself so it would be interesting to your listeners or listener. All that came back to me, I think. 
It was impossible to know, and presumably vampires have different tastes and stories than little boys. I thought of a few car journeys we'd had on those holidays to the ocean, when I would tell stories till I was hoarse. There was a lot you could do with the story of Beauty and the Beast, and I had done most of it, and I did it again now. I watched the arc of the sun over my left shoulder. The light crept across the floor, and the vampire had to move to stay out of it. First he had to move in one direction, sliding along the floor, as if all his joints pained him. How could he both look as if every moment were agony and still retain that curious, fluid agility? And then he had to slide back again, back again and further still, nearer to me. I moved to stay in the sun as he moved to stay out of it. I went on telling the story. There was no spot on the floor that he could have stayed in all day and stayed out of the light. Vampires, according both to myth and SOF, did something like sleep during the day, just as humans sleep at night. Do vampires need their sleep as we do? So it wasn't only food and freedom Bo was depriving this one of. He'd said it wasn't hunger that would break him. It was daylight. I wondered this passionately if I might be getting a sunburn, but I rarely burned anyway, and the idea in the present state of affairs, like worrying about a hangnail while you were being chased by an axe murderer, seemed so ludicrous I couldn't be bothered. The sun was sinking toward the end of day, and my voice was giving out. I had drunk several more mouthfuls of water in the course of the story. If you haven't seen a vampire's lips touch the mouth of your bottle, do you have to wipe it off first? I concluded in a vivid, not to say lurid, scene of all-inclusive rejoicing and felt silent. And fell silent. Thank you, he said. My tiredness was back, tenfold, a hundredfold. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I had to keep my eyes open. This was a vampire. Was this one of the ways to persuade a victim? Had he been killing two birds with one stone, so to speak? Make the day pass, make the victim amiable to handling? But didn't they like them unamenable? Unamenable? I couldn't help it. My eyes kept falling shut, my head would drop forward, and I would wake myself up when my neck cracked as my chin fell to my breastbone. Go to sleep, said his voice. The worst is over for me today. There are five hours till sunset. I am harmless till then. No vampire can kill in daylight. Sleep. You will want to be awake tonight. I remembered that there had been a blanket in the sack. I crawled over to it, pulled it out, put my head on the sack and the remaining loaf of bread, and was asleep before I had time to argue with myself about whether he was telling the truth or not. I dreamed. I dreamed as if the dream was waiting for me, waiting for the moment I fell asleep. I dreamed of my grandmother. I dreamed of walking by the lake with her. At first, the dream was more like a memory. I was little again, and she was holding my hand, and I had to skip occasionally to keep up with her. I had been proud of having her for a grandmother, and was sorry that I only ever saw her alone at the lake. I would have liked my school friends to meet her. Their grandmothers were also ordinary. Some of them were nice, and some of them were not so nice, but they were all sort of soft-edged. I didn't know how to put it even to myself. My grandmother wasn't hard or sharp, but there wasn't anything uncertain about her. She was unambiguously herself. I admired her hugely. She had long hair, and when the wind was blowing off the lake, it would get into a tremendous tangle, and sometimes she would let me brush it afterward at the cottage. She usually wore long, full skirts and soft shoes that made no sound, whatever she was walking on. My parents split up when I was six. I didn't see my grandmother for the first year after. It turned out that my mother had gone so far as to hire some ward crafters, smiths, scribes, spooks, the usual range, and on what money I don't know, 
to prevent anyone in my dad's family from finding us. My father hadn't wanted to let us go, and while his family are supposed to be some of the good guys, it's very hard not to do something you can do when you're angry, and it will get you what you want. After the first year and a day, he had probably cooled off, and my mom let the fancy wards lapse. My grandmother located us almost at once, and my mother, who can drive herself nuts sometimes by her own sense of fairness, agreed to let me see her. At first, I didn't want to see her because it had been a whole year and I'd been sick for a lot of it, and my mother had to tell me that sense of fairness again, what she'd done, and a little bit, scaled down to my age of why. I was only seven, but it had been a bad year. That conversation with my mother was one of those moments when my world really changed. I realized that I was going to be a grown-up myself someday and have to make horrible decisions like this too. So I agreed to see my gran again, and then I was glad I did. I was so happy to have her back. She and I had been meeting at the lake every few weeks for a little over a year, when one afternoon she said, I don't like what I am about to do, but I can't think of anything better. My dear, I have to ask if you will keep a secret from your mother for me. I looked at her in astonishment. This wasn't the sort of thing grown-ups did. They went around having secrets behind your back all the time about things that were hardly important to you, like my mom not telling me she'd hired the, wand the ward crafters, and then pretended they didn't. There had been a lot of that that nobody explained to me before my parents broke up, and I hadn't forgotten. Even at six or seven, I knew that my mom's ward crafters were the tip of an iceberg, but I still didn't know much about the iceberg. I didn't know, for example, that my father might have been a sorcerer till years later. And sometimes grown-ups said things like, oh, maybe you'd better not tell your parents about this, which either meant get out of there fast now or that they knew you would tell anyway because you were only a kid, but then they could get mad at you when you did. That this had happened several times with some of my dad's business associates is one of the reasons my mom left. But I knew my gran loved me, and I knew she was safe. I knew she'd never ask me anything bad. And I knew that she really, really meant it, that I had to keep this secret from my mother. Okay, I said. My gran sighed. I know that your mother means the best for you, and in many ways she's right. I'm very glad she got custody of you and not your dad, although he was very bitter about it at the time. I scowled. I never saw my dad. Once my grand had found me, he started writing me a lot of postcards, but I never saw him. And the postmarks on the cards were always blurry, so you couldn't see where they'd been sent from. All the postmarks were blurry, two or three a week sometimes. But she's wrong that simply keeping you ignorant of your father's heritage will make it as if that heritage doesn't exist. It does exist. You can choose to be your mother's daughter in all things, but it must be a choice. I am going to provide you with the means for making that choice. Otherwise, someday, that heritage you know nothing about may get you in a lot of trouble. I must have looked frightened because she took my hands in hers and gave them a squeeze. Or perhaps someday you will be in a lot of trouble and it will get you out of it. We were sitting on the porch of the cabin by the lake. We'd been walking earlier and had picked a little posy of wildflowers. She'd fetched a mug from the kitchen and filled it with water, and the flowers were standing in that on the rickety little table that still sat on the porch. We'd been walking in the sun, which was very warm, and were now sitting in the shade of the trees, which was pleasingly cool. I could feel the sweat on my face drying in the breeze. My grand pulled one of the flowers out of the mug, put it between my two hands, closed my hands together over it so it was invisible, and put her hands over mine. Now, what have you got in your hands, she said. This was a funny sort of game. I said, smiling, a flower. What else could you have inside your hands instead? What else is so small you can hide it completely, doesn't weigh very much, doesn't itch or tickle, is so soft you can barely feel it's there? Um, a feather, I said. A feather. Good. Now think feather. I thought feather. I thought a small gray-brown-white feather. A sparrow. Something like that. There was an odd, slightly buzzy sensation in my hands, under her hands. It was a little bit sick-making, but not very much. Now open your hands.
And this is going to be the break time.